to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Are you ready for the day of the Lord? Now, you might be initially thinking, what is the day of the Lord? When's it going to occur? And why do I need to get ready for that? My well, friend, these are all things that we'll talk about today from the minor prophet Joel. Joel's message is the day of the Lord is coming and God's people then needed to get ready. And friend, that message is still true for us today. We're so glad that you joined us for our study of the minor prophets, specifically today, thinking about the book of Joel. We hope that you'll get your Bible. If you don't have your Bible, we want to ask you to pause for just a moment and locate your Bible, have it ready to use as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study today. Friend, as always, today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Lord's Church. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, uh, whether that be for worship on Sunday or Bible study on Wednesday, please know that you would be an honored guest at any of their services. You'll find people there who love God, who are deeply concerned about spiritual matters. If you've got a Bible question, you want to know more about something like the day of the Lord or the gospel of Jesus Christ or, or whatever Bible question you may have, you'll find people there who'd be happy to sit down, open up the Word of God, and in kindness and love, look at what the Scripture has to say on those matters. And so check out the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ in your area. Friend, we'd also love to help you in your desire to study God's Word here at The Gospel of Christ. You can visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our Bible study material. We have audio lessons, video lessons, transcripts, study questions, written material, just a wide variety of good Bible study material. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of this series on the Minor Prophets or any of our past lessons, go to our website, fill out a media request form. We can send that to you as a digital download, or if you need another format, we could send that to you as well. But you can receive that free of charge, and we'll be happy to help you in your study of God's Word in any way that we can. Also, check us out on Facebook, as well as the Gospel of Christ app, available both for the iPhone and Android. It's a great way to keep up with what we're doing in our fast-paced world and stay in touch with our latest updates. And so again, we welcome you to our study of the powerful, it's a short little book, but it's a very powerful book, the book of Joel. Let me get, begin by asking you this question. Have you ever seen any type of maybe plague by some type of, of animal or insect especially. I remember when I was young, raised in uh, East Texas and a farm in East Texas, I remember there were two or three different years there where we had grasshoppers come in and they ate and chewed up. There was like a, a plague of grasshoppers and they were really big, what we think of locusts. I remember just they were everywhere. They got on everything and they, if you weren't careful, they ate the leaves off and destroyed everything. Maybe you've seen some other type of insects where there was just a, a plague of them, as it were, and they covered everything and made a, made a big mess. Well, can you imagine if you had planted a, a garden and it was getting close to the time for the tomatoes and the cucumbers and the squash and the corn and, and, and the, everything to produce. In fact, the blooms were starting to come on and everything was looking real good. And then one morning you get up and there is a plague of locusts that came through and chewed every plant you own down to the ground. 
Can you imagine how that would have been if there were no grocery stores to go to and there were no backup plans and you were going to starve if your farm or garden didn't produce? Well, in the book of Joel, God presents this locust plague. And these locusts are described as chewing locusts and flying locusts and all these various locusts. And they, they come in and they just t d demolish everything. And God's reminding them there's a day of reckoning coming. If you're not right and your peop my people are not right and your lives are not being lived right, there's a day of the Lord coming when you'll have to get an account of that. And so the idea of Joel is that of desolation and repentance. The locust plague uh, by these armies that are going to come in and take over God's people is a call to repentance. I think the key verse in the book of Joel is Joel chapter 2, verse number 13. Joel says in that verse, rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. The, the, the idea with God's people was throughout the history, if you study the history of Israel and of the Jews, they were great at these outward signs of repentance. They would tear their garments. Um, they would sit around the ash heap. They would pluck the hair out of their beard and their eyebrows. They would, they would throw dust on their head and ash on their head and all these great outward signs of repentance. And God said, cut that out in essence. I want you to rend your heart, tear your heart, and stop tearing your clothes, as it were. Return to God. Bring forth the fruits that God wants you to bring. You know, anybody can put a suit on, get in a car, and ride to services on Sunday. Anybody can open up a Bible and read a verse. But letting that book mark you, you could get out your highlighter and you can mark verses all throughout your Bible. But letting that book mark you, making changes in your life when you hear the word of God proclaimed and when you worship, that's a whole different story. And that's what the book of Joel is all about. Are you ready for the day of the Lord? Joel reminds us of that powerful thing. Now, let's begin by looking at some of the living messages, some of the practical messages with this theme in mind, the day of the Lord that Joel reminds us of. Look in Joel chapter 1, verse 3. As we think about the day of the Lord, what an awesome responsibility parents and grand grandparents have to train their children to be ready for that day and to know God. Look in Joel 1, verse 3. Tell your children about it. About what? The day of the Lord. Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. You've got to look not just at the immediate, but you've got to look out to the future. Are we preparing not only ourselves, but our children and our grandchildren to one day stand before God and have to give an account? The job, the job of parents and grandparents to train their children is such an awesome responsibility in preparation for that day. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 verse 4, Parents, fathers, bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And of course, we first hear that in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. When you walk by the way, when you lie down, put it like frontlets on your eyes, write it on the doorpost of your house. Everywhere you go, everywhere your children go, teach, teach them to know the Lord and to be ready one day to give an account to God who created them and who they're amenable to. And so preparing for that day is an awesome responsibility. Now, as you think about Joel's message, we mentioned the illustration of the locust plague and the devastation and the crisis that that naturally would have caused. But what was that What was that locust plague designed to do? Well, it was designed to do these things. In chapter 1, verse 5, it was designed to awaken them. Awake, you drunkards, Joel will say. It was designed to cause weeping and shame. Chapter 1, verse number 8 Joel says, lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth. It was designed to make one ashamed. Chapter 1, verse number 11, be ashamed, you farmers. And then chapter 2, verse 13, 
It was designed to make them rend their hearts, not their garments. Friend, any time that crisis, devastation, anytime things come into our lives that bring heartache, those things ought to make us think. They ought to make us wake up. You know, a lot of people got serious when 9-11 happened about God. When, when, when catastrophic events happen, some earthquakes, some floods, some great disease outbreak occurs, people then kind of wake up. But oftentimes, if we're not careful, it's too late then. When things happen, we need to realize, I got to wake up. I need to think about what's really serious. That ought to cause us to feel sorrowful, maybe, for how we've been living and what we've been doing. We ought to be ashamed to do some of the things that maybe we've done in the past, and it definitely ought to bring us to a point of repentance toward Almighty God. Now, this idea of the day of the Lord, what was it for the people during Joel's time? Look in your Bible in Joel chapter 1, verse number 15. This is described as a day of destruction. Alas, for the day. What day? For the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. And so it was a day of destruction. It was a day of darkness and gloom. Look in chapter 2, verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm, let all the inhabitants of, it, of the land tremble. The day of the Lord is coming. It is at hand, a day of darkness and gloominess. It was a great and terrible day. Chapter 2, verse number 11. The Lord gives voice before his army. His camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Chapter 2, verse 31. It's a great an awesome day. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. But then there's this idea I don't want you to miss. It's also a day of decision making. Look in chapter 3, verse number 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now, friend, we've talked about the day of the Lord in the book of Joel, and those armies were going to come in, and they were going to destroy some of God's people. They were going to take over their land. There was definitely going to be a day of reckoning, but depending on how each person's relationship with God was, that's how that day went. You know, there's another day coming. Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour when the Son of Man comes. Matthew 24, verses 34 through 36 the Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, he will come again a second time apart from sin for salvation. The Lord is coming back. He will take vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 8 through 10. The question is, what type of day will that be for me? Is that going to be a day of destruction? Will it be a day of darkness and gloom? Will it be a great and terrible day? Or will it be an awesome day when God comes back to claim his own and we're caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air? Now is the day of decision making. Now is the opportunity to prepare for that day. Waiting till it gets here won't work. Now's the time and now's the opportunity to prepare for the day of the Lord. But as Joel speaks to these people, Joel is really trying to drive home and identify that they've got to have a heart of real repentance for God. Friend, what God wants in us is for us to change our heart, to think like he thinks, to put away the things he wants us to put away, and to have a heart that is in line with God. Look at what Joel says in chapter 2. I want you to look in verses 12 through 14 with me. Now therefore says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows? If he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Friend, when I think about my relationship, as we think about our relationship with God, what God wants of us is for us to change our hearts. Repent and turn. To turn from sin 
and to turn to God, to have a heart that turns back all of us. If you're of an accountable age, you've sinned. I've sinned. The soul who sins will surely die. All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. God wants us to have a heart for him, to turn back to God to turn back to the way of right, to leave the world and to leave sin and to, to leave all that behind and really give ourselves and our heart to God. Don't just put on an outward appearance. That facade won't work. You can look like, you can sound like, and you can act like a religious person. But until you change who you are on the inside, you're like what Jesus said of the Jews. They're like whitewashed tombs, beautiful, ornate on the outside. Inwardly, they're full of dead men's bones, rot and filth and decay. And so we got to look to our heart. And that's a real indicator of who we are and how we're living in the sight of God. And then my friend Joel reminds these people, as we need to be reminded as well, although that day of the Lord, a day of destruction for them, it could be any time restoration and, ho and hope are just around the corner for those who repent. Look at the beautiful words of Joel 2 verse 25. Joel's message of the day of the Lord is not just a message of doom and gloom. It's also a message of restoration and hope for those who change their life. Look in chapter 2 verse 25. If they're willing to change, God says, so I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army, which I sent in among you. Yeah, there was going to be destruction. It was just around the corner for some. But God says, if you'll repent, I'll fill your, I'll fill your fields with crops. I'll restore everything that was taken away. Restoration, hope, and blessing. Listen to Joel. I love the words of Joel 2.14. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. When God pronounces doom and when God warns people of destruction and God tells them to change their life, God also accentuates the positive. Hope, restoration, blessing, relief from destruction. Friend, those are all things that Christians are promised if we leave a life of sin. The Bible tells us every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1 verse 3. We have hope in this life and in the life to come, Romans 8 verse 1. We, we have that idea that we are redeemed and restored into a relationship with Almighty God, Ephesians 1 and 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood the forgiveness of our sins. And so if we repent, Acts 3 verse 19, blessings will indeed flow of a spiritual nature from Almighty God's throne. But then there is what we think of as one of the most powerful prophetic passages in all of the minor prophets probably. It's the message of Pentecost in Joel chapter 2. Verses 28 through 30. I want you to see this message. Joel 2, verses 28 through 30. Look at it with me. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Also on my men servants and my maid servants. I will pour out my spirit in those days and I will show wonders in heaven and earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance as the Lord has said among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Now, ultimately, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about God restoring Israel to a place of, of grandeur and their sublime height that they'd like to be? Not really. You want to know the real prophecy, the real fulfillment of this? Hold your finger right here in Joel. And I want you to flip over to Acts chapter 2 with me. In Acts chapter 2, the gospel is now being preached for the very first time. 40 days, 50 days before that, Jesus was crucified on the day of Pentecost. 
Uh, G, uh, the church is now going to go into fulfillment. Gospel is going to be preached. People are going to receive remission of sins. And look in Acts chapter 2. They made the claim. After some spoke with unknown tongues, somebody stood up and said, these men are drunk with new wine. And Peter stands up and he says, no, they're not. It's what the third hour of the day. It's only 9 a.m. These men are not drunk with new wine. This is what Joel prophesied about. Look at what he says in verse 16. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in these last days. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall see dreams. And he goes on and quotes that whole passage. And he says in verse 22, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God, by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did in your midst, as you know, him being delivered up by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you've taken with lawless hands have crucified and put to death, him God raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Peter, Peter basically says, this prophecy is fulfilled today in everything that is being promised comes through Jesus and you can be saved in him. And so as we think about the prophet Joel in the day of the Lord, it ultimately points to that great day of salvation. The Spirit came upon all people there, came upon the people there. They prophesied in unknown tongues. Uh, it was in Jerusalem, like Joel 2, verse 32 said, everything lines up for this to be the opening of the doors to the kingdom of God, the eternal kingdom. Daniel 2, verse 44, Revelation 14, verse 11, 11, 14, and 15 for Jews, for the Jews in Jerusalem, as well as eventually for the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. And so what a beautiful picture of the Lord's church coming into fulfillment in this great event. But just like in Joel's day, and just like in Acts chapter 2, there's a lot of people still in the valley of decision. Look in chapter 3, verse 14. Joel said, multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. When God gave this message through the prophet Joel, people then had a decision to make. Are we going to start stop putting on a show, stop just tearing our garments? Are we really going to change our lives and live for God? At the fulfillment of that great prophecy in Joel 2.28, Peter preached the word to those people. The Bible says they cried, they were pricked in their heart and they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? A lot of people stood in the valley of decision then and Peter told them to repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And friend, there's still a lot of people today who are standing in that valley. They know the darkness of the world on the other side. They know the sunshine that lies ahead in Jesus Christ. But they've got to get out of the valley of decision, climb that mountain and come to the other side. Where are you at right now with that? Are you in the valley of decision? Have you put it off? Have you been thinking maybe one day you would? Have you wanted to, but you just kind of got caught up in the world and all its stuff? If you stay in the valley of decision, and you never do anything, you've made a decision. You've decided to stay right where you are, right where Satan wants you, and that day of the Lord will not be a good day for you. And so we beg you today, we plead with you to get out of the valley of decision and do something. Friend, as you, as you think about your life, as you think about the things that are most important, I want you to fathom this idea. Think about this idea for just a moment. When the last second on the time of clock ticks, whether that be the Lord's coming or whether that be the last second of your life, the final curtain falls and it all comes to an end. Are you ready for the day of the Lord? Are you ready for that final day? Are you sure that you've done what God says? 
Maybe right now you're still in that old valley of decision. Friend, it's time to get up. It's time to get out of the valley of decision and decide. You can't, can't waver anymore. Life's too short. You can't keep living for the world anymore. That's not going to get you. That only puts you on the other side of darkness. If you're really in the valley of decision, it's time to do something. It's time to make a decision to follow God. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1 and 2 says, Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. You know what would be the worst thing probably of all? If you're still in that valley of decision, you've never committed to one side or the other, wouldn't it be terrible if you were going to do that and the day of the Lord came and you weren't able to? Wouldn't it be terrible if you waited too long and you never put on the Lord Jesus Christ? Friend, we urge you today to get out of the valley of decision and obey the gospel. Become a New Testament Christian, access the blood of Jesus, and do what God says. On the day of Pentecost, when Joel 2, 28 through 32 was fulfilled, they asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? And that answer was so clear. Peter said, repent to people who already believed in Jesus now. They already believe Jesus is the Son of God. Peter said you need to repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. The Bible says those who gladly received his word were baptized, Acts 2.42, and the Lord added to his church that day those who were saved. If you'll obey the gospel, friend, you can become a Christian. You can get on God's side. You can have every sin washed away. You can be prepared to live with God for eternity. And so we beg you today, don't stay in that valley any longer. Make a decision. If you are a Christian and you change things in your life, do it in view of the day of the Lord. It's a day coming. Be ready for that day. We hope you'll join us next time as we study more from the Minor Prophets. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On demand, downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the Gospel of Christ.